Okay, so we are going to now begin non-parametric hypothesis testing. Um, I'm not going to get right into the max t distribution, which we saw last time is a useful way for controlling multiple comparisons, but today's the point of today's lecture is just to do an overview of permutation tests. Make sure you're ready for this. Uh, what's the difference between cluster-wise and voxel-wise correction? And why do we use the max distribution, and what does it do for us? If you do not know the answers to these two questions, revisit these two lectures, thresholding brain stat maps and parametric approaches for controlling family-wise error rate, part two. So I've talked about this before, parametric versus non-parametric. Parametric assumes some shape to the distribution. There are parameters associated with that distribution, one or more. Um, T distribution has degrees of freedom, normal distribution has the mean and the variance, etc. Non-parametric has no assumption on the distribution shape. And you use your data to construct the distribution. So this is related to the bootstrap and jackknife, but it's not the same. Um, sometimes I see it kind of misexplained or misdescribed in a paper. Um, the reason why uh, I especially don't like when bootstrap is used because bootstrap often refers to resampling your data with replacement and we're most certainly not doing that here. Uh, if you don't know what I just said, don't worry about it. It's just, we'll move along. Okay, the permutation test generally can be used when the true distri distribution shape is unknown. So for example, if you know your data don't follow a normal distribution, you can use a permutation test. Um, generally, it doesn't control for multiple comparisons, um, only if you use it with a max t, or I'm sorry, not max t, it doesn't have to be max t, but with a max distribution, which we won't do today, but we will do next time. So remember, permutation tests, they aren't a magic fix for multiple comparisons unless we're using it with the appropriate statistic. And they're actually limited in how much they can fix distributional assumptions. Um, Maybe I'll do a simulation later just to illustrate this. So it can do weird with wonky looking distributions, but if it's if you have heteroscedasticity, for example, with really huge outliers, um, the permutation test isn't really going to fix that. So again, we're going to use these two things in conjunction, and we can tackle two problems, not knowing the structure of the distribution and controlling the family-wise error rate. Wow, I'm really drilling this point on home um, without using the max statistics what we're doing today so we know how it works with the max statistic will be next time so we understand how to control family-wise error. Okay, again the parametric distribution assumes some known distribution shape as we're showing here. Under the null hypothesis you find the upper tail probability that's 5% and the threshold associated with it, and then you apply this threshold to your statistics. Non-parametric, you use the data to generate this distribution. So you can see this here, this distribution here is not Gaussian or a T, it's, it's a little um, skewed. But you do the same thing. You find the 5% uh, tail of the tail, and the threshold associated with that then can be used to threshold your statistic. And you can do this with any statistic. So, I mean, typically we use the mean divided by the standard deviation, the t-statistic, but you could just use the mean as your statistic. You could use non-parametric approaches to study hypotheses about your variance. So any statistic. So how do we permute the data? So I'm going to use this toy example. Uh, we have data from a voxel in a visual stimulus experiment where there's a flashing checkerboard, that's task A, versus baseline, just a fixation cross, which is task B. So we have six blocks of this task in this order, A, B, A, B, A, B. And let's pretend we're analyzing our data in kind of a weird way. You wouldn't do this in practice. This is just to illustrate the permutation test, but we just took an average within each uh, block and use that as our activation estimate. So Brain activation is 103 for the first A, it's 90 for the first B, 99.93, blah, blah, blah. You see it. So these are the activation magnitudes for our blocks. 
So the null hypothesis is that there's no experimental effect and we want to generate the null distribution. Well, if we don't have an effect, then these A and B labels are completely arbitrary. So what we're going to do is we're going to shuffle these labels. If A versus B it doesn't mean anything, then it really doesn't matter what the labels are. And the statistic of interest here is A versus B, so it's the, the difference in the means or the mean of the difference, the mean difference. So that's our statistic. So what we're going to do is we're going to shuffle these labels. We're going to keep it with three A's and three B's, but just shuffle them around. And we're going to compute our statistic, the mean difference, multiple for each of those shuffles. So you get something like this. So we do all the equivalent relabelings. So since we have three label, or sorry, uh, six, six things with two possible labels, we have a total of 20 orderings. And then for each of these orderings, we compute the statistic. So that's what these are. So same data that were on the previous slide. Let's just shuffle the labels and recompute your t-statistic. Or your, sorry, in this case, the statistic is the mean difference. And you get all of these. Then what you have to do is find the upper fifth percentile since we have 20. Oh, and just something to point out here. In this case, um, you can see this distribution will be symmetric because AAABBB has the same magnitude but the opposite sign of BBBAAA. So you can see all these are repeated. This one 3.25 matches with the negative 3.25 over here. Anyhow, since we have 20 values, what we do is we find the upper fifth percentile, which in this case will be, since we have 20 uh, numbers, it will be the biggest statistic. So the 95th percentile of our permutation distribution is this one right here, 9.45. That's our largest value. And it just so turns out, which means that this is our threshold. Anything equal to or larger than this is significant. Well, turns out this is the original ordering. So we would reject the null in favor of the alternative. Alternatively, haha, you can look at the distribution of the values here. This is a histogram. Um, then you would find the upper fifth percentile, which is right here. And then the threshold is right here associated with that. So one uh, restriction with permutation tests is that they don't work well with small sample size because you can't get enough shuffles in. So in this previous example, um, the smallest p-value I can have is 1 out of 20, right? Because I only have it was 0.05. And actually, the only possible p-values are going to be uh, multiples of 0.05. So 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15. So it tends, up, it tends to be conservative for small sample sizes because you don't have enough. Actually, if you have fewer than 20, you can't even get a p-value as small as 0.05. So typically you want to run, uh, I don't know, I'll say 5,000 permutations if you can. I typically start with 1,000, see if there's any promise, any hope, and then I rerun it with 5,000 for publication purposes. Uh, the one assumption that's incredibly important is the assumption of exchangeability. Exchangeability means that when we do this label reshuffling, we're not changing the distribution of the data. So other things about the distribution that we're not specifically testing. So under the null, exchangeability justifies permuting the data and allows us to permute, uh, build this permutation distribution. So for example, subjects are exchangeable. Under the null, each subject's A, B labels can be flipped, right? Um, just assuming there's no correlation here. Uh, even, okay, so let's say the subjects are A, B. So, so say the A, B labels here are group A, group B, then we should be able to just flip the labels between A and B. One exception to this rule about subjects being exchangeable is if we have twins in our data set or siblings or family members, we can't just, um, if we take uh, the mother in one family and put her as the mother in another family, we've now broken the correlation structure that exists within each family. So that is not exchangeable. But if your subjects are independent, they're exchangeable. fMRI scans are not exchangeable for the same reason uh, correlation between the measures. In this case, it's temporal autocorrelation. So we can't permute our values over time. 
Um, for two sample t-tests, how do you do the, the shuffling? So if you have two groups, group one and group two, you would shuffle the group labels, uh, just as we did in the example I showed earlier, uh, shuffling the black labels. With a one sample t-test, uh, you would just randomly flip the sign of the values for some subjects. So this is assuming you've already computed a within subject difference. So let's say you have time two minus time one, you're looking for a within subject um, brain activation change over two sessions. So you would randomly permute um, by multiplying that difference by a negative one. So that's equivalent to doing, to randomly switching some subjects from time two minus time one to time one minus time two. Have all that. Uh, what is permuted for one sample t-test? Make sure you know that. What is permuted for a two sample, oh, by the way, Oh, I think I said paired t-test. I, I meant one sample t-test here. Uh, same difference. What's permuted for a two sample t-test? And what's permuted for a correlation? I didn't actually talk about that, but see if you can puzzle it out. And why are small sample sizes problematic for permutation testing? I think, I at least think randomized kind of spits out a warning if you're, you're too small. Or actually you'll know, it'll tell you that it only had like five permutations possible. Uh, then you know you're in trouble. All right, well, thank you. Please join the Facebook group, Mumford Brain Stats, and enjoy the rest of your day.